I'm using for a text today verses from our Lord's Gospel according to Matthew 6th chapter, and I'll begin reading with verse 5. Matthew 6, chapter, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard... For they are much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I'm using for a subject today the last word in verse 13. Amen. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) Amen. Now, sermon should do at least four things for you. One, it should stretch your mind. It should inform you. It should instruct you. Two, it should tan your hide. (laughs) That is, it should correct you. Three, it should warm your heart. It should inspire you. Four, it should provoke the will. It should challenge you to do what the Lord would have you do. Now, prayer is man's job. Every one of us has a check made out on the bank of heaven. But many fail to cash it at the window of prayer. I say prayer is man's job. It's the only unending obligation that our Lord has given to man. He did not say that men ought to always work. He did not say that men ought to always play. But men ought to always to pray. Pray when you're successful, lest you become selfish. Pray when you are in sorrow, lest you become cynical. Pray when you are in prosperity, lest you become proud. Pray when you are in material poverty, lest you become spiritually poor, and that's the worst kind of poverty. In sin... Man declares his independence of God. 
In prayer, man declares his dependence upon God. Now, prayer is perplexingly paradoxical. That is, you have to pray in order to pray. Out of all of our schools, our Bible colleges, our seminaries, our institutions, we have courses that uh, teach us a little of everything. But nobody offers a course in prayer uh, simply because there's only one teacher, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When the disciples saw how lacking they were in prayer, they prayed, Lord, and notice they didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach, or Lord, teach us to work miracles, or Lord, teach us to be wise, but Lord, teach us to pray. Uh, now, some people think that prayer is a monologue where you do all the talk. And some of us talk to the Lord just like he doesn't know what's happening in this world. Uh, some of us talk to him uh, like we have to inform him of what's going on. Uh, some talk to him like they're picketing the throne of grace. They're trying to get him to change his mind. He. He's hesitant to hear. He's reluctant to answer. He's hard of hearing. We have to scream at him. We have to tell him to come here and do that. We can order. We can tell the Lord to do so many things. And now, prayer is just not a monologue, but prayer is a dialogue. Not only must you talk to God, but you've got to wait and let him talk to you. And it's far better for us to hear what the Lord has to say than it is for him to hear what we have to say. For we don't know what to say. We don't know what to ask for. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. Now, praiseful worship is due God. We are here today to glory in his grace, to meditate on his might and his mercy, and to put his praises before our petitions. You see, if we would thank the Lord for what he's already doing for us, uh, we wouldn't ask him for so much. Instead of uh, counting your bruises, you ought to spend some time counting your blessings. Instead of lamenting over what you've lost, thank God that you have for what you have left. Instead of numbering your enemies, thank God that you have some friends. And I have a friend above all others in Jesus Christ. Now, I used to murmur and whine and complain. And everybody was after me. I was infected with inferiority complex. Oh, but when I found Jesus precious to my soul, I moved off of Complaint Avenue and I'm now living on Thanksgiving Boulevard. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. Now, personal worship is due from man. He has access to the throne of grace and can come under God. He must worship with his whole heart and sincerely give thanks. Now, public worship is a privilege and duty of redeemed souls united in faith and fellowship and the furtherance of the gospel. Don't you know it's a blessing just to be 
present here today. The Lord has blessed you. Yes, he has. Just to be able to attend Founders Week. Oh, if the Lord has done anything for you, you ought to say so. That's the reason David said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If the Lord has redeemed you, if he has done anything for you, if he has given you anything and everything I am and everything I have above nothing, the Lord gave it to me. If the Lord has done anything for you, the least you can do is say so. Let the congregation of all who love and serve God join together in the mercy seat, where they may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Prayer is a great privilege of redeemed souls, I say. Prayer is a weapon in the hour of conflict. It's a defense in the moment of peril. It's a retreat in the seasons of exhaustion. Oh, I said I was going to talk about amen. All right. Amen simply means that which is credible, that which is certain, that which is true. Amen simply means so be it, as it is in thy purpose as it is in thy promises, so be it in our praises, so be it in our prayers. Now, in the Old Testament, there are at least 30 references to Amen. In the New Testament, there are at least 50 references to Amen. And in every one of these references, you will find that amen is a word of affirmation. It has the force of a superlative, and it has a note of finality. When you have said it, you have said it. There's just not a thing else to top it. And the best you can do is repeat it. And don't knock repetition. You know, every once in a while I'll preach a sermon at Calvary where I pastor and uh, one that I have preached before. And invariably somebody will come up and say, I heard that one before. And I said, yes, and if it didn't bear repeating, I shouldn't have preached it in the first place. Uh, don't knock repetition, you see. Uh, there are no degrees of holiness. See, God is just holy. He's not more holy one day and less holy another day. He's just holy. I hear Isaiah saying, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up his train, filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy! And the one in the south tried to find uh, something better to come up with it, and he couldn't come up with it. He said, Holy! The one in the east tried to find something to top it, and he couldn't. He cried, Holy! The one in the west, Holy! Holy is the Lord of hosts. God is just holy. And then amen simply means saying yes to the Lord. And everybody here ought to say yes to the Lord. You ought to let him have his way in your life. Or oh, we say we want revival and we say, Lord, send us revival. Send us revival. The Lord says, if my people which are called by my name 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You won't have to worry. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. We just won't allow the Lord to send a revival through us. We will not say yes to the If you would say yes to the Lord, you will not only see what he can do for you and what he can do with you, but what he can do through you. Yes to the Lord. Let him have his way. Now, amen is an, an indication of Solomon's sense. On the part of an individual or an assembly. It was used in the synagogue and it is now used in the Christian congregation. It was customary to use amen at the giving of thanks. Our Lord used amen when he introduced a statement that he wished to vest with special authority, he would often say, truly, truly, I say unto you, or verily, verily, I say unto you, simply, amen, amen, I say unto you. The title amen is given to our Lord in the epistle to the church at Laodicea. Paul preached about Christ, the amen, the seal of God's promises. Now, in all of these references, amen makes a doxology what it is. In every one of these references, every time one would hear someone praising the Lord, uh, they would say amen. And then even in Ezra's time, when the scriptures were read, all of the people said amen. Not some of them, but all of the people said amen. You know, we think amen is for people who don't know any better. <laughs> but I've come to tell you it is for people who do know better. You know, the first five years of my preaching ministry, I used to ask the congregation to say amen. When I'd get up, I'd say, say amen, church. I say amen for what? <laughs> I hadn't said anything yet. <laughs> but I tell them to say amen. But I soon learn better than that. I don't want to encourage anybody to be a hypocrite. If you don't know what is being said, if you don't understand it, then just keep quiet. You know, <laughs> but if you, if you recognize the truth, if the Lord is really your shepherd, when somebody is praising him, if he's yours, you can't help but say amen. I say, amen is for people who do know better. You know, Paul, in talking about spiritual gifts uh, to the Corinthians, he says, Now, I know that God will give uh, each one of us a gift that he wants us to have. He'll give you something that he does not give me. And he'll give me something that he does not give you. Now, if you don't have what I have, don't knock it. And he said, now, each one of us has the gift that the Lord wants us to have. And he talked specifically to those uh, who spoke in tongues. He said, now... 
I'm not negating, trying to negate the fact that the Lord can cause a person to speak another language on the spot. Another language. Not some babbling, uh, not something that you don't understand, nor anybody else. And if they ask you, what did you say, you get angry with them. Not that kind. But uh, he can cause you to speak another language on the spot. Why, if the Lord opened the mouth of a mule and calls him to speak, surely he can take a high school graduate and teach him to speak. <laughs> but Paul says, if you insist in speaking in tongues, then get you an interpreter. So how can these people say amen when they don't know what you're talking about? <laughs> Let me tell you, our sophistication is sapping the life out of our religion. You know, we work hard at being dignified. <laughs> don't you know when you quench the Spirit, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen will work anywhere if you'll allow it. I know what I'm talking about. March 15, 1970, I was one of the ten preachers from across this nation to be invited to be guest of the President of the United States uh, in the White House. Now, I used to love to tell this before Watergate. But we were invited, uh, yes, to the White House. And uh, that Sunday morning, we were among 360 dignitaries from around the world, heads of state. Well, there was more dignity there per square inch than you could have found anywhere. <laughs> that Sunday morning, the worship service in the East Room of the White House. And Dr. Billy Graham was preaching that morning, and he was uh, talking on the 23rd Psalms, and he kept hammering away on of how good God is, and how great he is, and how gracious he is. And there were two or three of us who stood it just about as long as we could, and we, we let loose with amen. And you know, it caught on, and we had a shouting good time in the East Room of the White House. The next morning, the Washington Post had his headlines, Amen, sounded in the White House. <laughs> it'll, it'll work anywhere. But we, we won't allow it, you know. We won't allow it. And some people trying to justify they're not using it will say, Well, I don't know whether to use it at the beginning or in the middle or at the end. I don't like to interrupt. I just like to sit and listen. Don't you know you can't interrupt a God-called preacher by saying amen? <laughs> if you think you can, you try it. <laughs> and then some will say, I would use it, but I don't know whether to pronounce it amen or amen. <laughs> you know, you know, when it comes to things spiritual, we can get so technical. But you're not misleading me. You know when to pronounce T-H-E, the, and when to pronounce it, the. You know to say the east and the west. But what does it matter? The Lord isn't concerned about how you pronounce your words. He's concerned about the condition of your heart. And then some will say, well, amen is just something that they picked up, and I wish they'd leave it out. I heard a man say some time ago, there's an old brother in our church that just says amen so loud and so frequently, it turns me off. Well, if somebody else puts too much seasoning on his food, that isn't going to keep me from seasoning mine to my taste. 
Well, let's see if amen is just something that really has no meaning. It can easily be left off. Or... Well, Jesus himself said, when you pray, pray after this manner. And many of us get tripped up right there. We start arguing, some will say, the Lord means for you to just recite these words. And then some will say, no, he didn't mean you for you just to recite those words only. He meant for you to recite those words. And then after you have done that, then say something on your own. And then somebody else will say, no, he didn't mean that. He means for you to say something on your own and then close out (laughs) with these words. The Lord simply said, pray after this manner. Now, when I was in elementary school, I was taught to add and multiply, subtract and divide. And then uh, they gave me some problems. And before every set of problems, they gave me some examples to show me how to work the problem. Now, that didn't mean that all of the numbers that I was going to see in the example would be the same numbers that I would encounter. Whatever numbers you encounter, work it after this manner. And then we were taught letter writing. We were taught that any good letter had to have at least six parts. In the first place, you had to have the name of the person to whom you're writing. The name in this prayer letter is Our Father. In order to pray, you've got to pray Our Father. I've got to pray for you and you've got to pray for me. Our Father. Now, if God is your Father and He is my Father, that makes us brothers. Because a man will not accept another man as brother until he recognizes that they both have the same father. We've got to pray our father. You don't like that too well, do you? (laughs) Our father. And then we had to have the address of the one to whom you're writing. Which art in heaven. And somebody gets the idea that God is a remote God. He's sitting high somewhere, and we have to tell him to come here and go yonder. Tell him to go out in California and see about my son. Go by the hospital and visit the sick and do this and do that. That's that other fellow who has to go to and fro. The Lord is already here. He's everywhere here. You see, I said that other fellow has to go to and fro. He had to come here. But the Lord is already here. And poor fella, that other fella, had to, uh, he had to catch him a ride. You had to bring him. But the Lord is already here. And then uh, they were, we were taught as a greeting and a salutation. Now, the greeting or salutation you use will depend upon what you think about the person to whom you're writing. If you're writing to Mary and she is a casual friend, you're satisfied to just say, Dear Mary. But brother, if you love Mary, you will spend a little time (laughs) trying to think of a name sweeter than that name. Now, you know what a name is. Go ahead and put it down there. But no, you want a name sweeter than that name. Dear, just go and say Mary. No, but you love her. The greeting or salutation in this prayer letter is, Hallowed be thy name. This name is holy. This name is excellent. This name is everlasting. 
This is a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. I cannot see for the life of me why some people can uh, name the name Jesus in church. And when they get out there and get ready to use uh, vulgarity and profanity and start swearing, they reach and get that holy name and drag it down through the fifth. Hallowed be thy name. That name is to be respected. That's the only name, don't you know, that's the only name that will save you. That's the only name we can meet in. That's the only name we can pray in. Hallowed be thy name. And then we were taught uh, that when you start the body of the letter, always express some interest in the one to whom you're writing. Don't start off talking about yourself, I this and I that. Uh, always express some interest in the one you're writing. Those of us who've been away from home, possibly in school, and we needed something, it didn't take us long to learn how to ask about the other sisters and brothers, the aunts and the uncles, and then go on and tell them to send you a hundred dollars. <laughs> always express some interest in the one you're writing. We start the body of this prayer letter by praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And then when you've expressed some interest in Him, then go on and ask Him for what you want. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then we were taught that there is a complimentary cloak. Now, the complimentary close differs from the greeting or salutation in that now you can't figure out who you are. I am your. Uh, I am your. And you'll spend uh, time, about an hour, uh, trying to figure out what you are. I am. Uh, you know who you are. Go and put it on him. I am your. And then, finally, when you arrive at it, then you will say, I am yours forever and always. And, uh, well, you will put several forevers there and ever. And then you'll underscore it two or three times and put some exclamation points there. Now, now you might change your mind tomorrow, but for now, it's forever. Uh, in this complimentary close to this prayer letter, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's a complimentary close. Thine is the kingdom. And who ever heard of a kingdom without a king? Yeah, who is your king? I wish I had time to tell you about mine, but, uh, but I will tell you this, that he will let you know who's who and what's what. I told you about my being invited to the White House for the first time, and now that meant a great deal to me. That might not mean a thing to you, it might be an everyday occurrence. But for a little black boy born down in Brazos Bottom, Texas, oh, trampled on, and uh, uh, people said he'd never amount to anything and never get anywhere. You might as well take him out of school. Oh, the Lord saved me. I'm talking about he uh, built me up and uh, filled me up and, and then made a preacher out of me. And then had the President of the United States to invite me as his guest in the White House. And, and, and you know, I, I, I love to talk about it, you know. <laughs> and every... 
uh, for about two months after that visit, uh, everybody I'd talk with, I'd try to weave the conversation around. <laughs> Let them know I'd been to the White House. You know, I'd love to tell them how good I felt being guarded by the same security officers as the President of the United States. I, I told them how good I felt sitting there talking with the President of the United States for three hours and 15 minutes. I told them how good I felt. But now that was in March. In September that same year, I was in Rome. And the president, the president of the United States, was to be in, in Rome two days after I had departed. I said, no, I'm just going to stay right here until my king comes. I'm going to stay right here until my president comes. Now, I didn't think I'd get a chance to see him, but I just want to have it said that I was in Rome at the same time the president. And while going around sightseeing, I saw a letter on the wall, Nixon, Rome will be your grave. I said, uh-oh. I got out of there and I went on down in Africa. <laughs> I, found, I found out that, that there are some circumstances in which my earthly king couldn't do me any good. I found out that somebody had to protect him. I found out uh, that uh, he was on shaky ground, and, and then that made me draw close to my shown of king. <laughs> my king, my king is the only one qualified to be king. You know, all of the others uh, have to be, they are born princes, but uh, my king was born king. All these others had to become king. They had to wait till the father died, or if the mother was a ruling monarch, wait until she died. And then they became king. But my king was born king. The Bible says my king is a seven-way king. He's a king of the Jews. That's a racial king. He's a king of Israel. That's a national king. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the fundament showeth his handiwork. My king uh, is, a, is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his soulless supplies. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's august and he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He is the supreme problem in high criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the coronal necessity for spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's, he, yes, he is. He is the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges 
debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. Well, <laughs> this is my king. He is a key. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. But he's in the... Yeah! 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 He's indescribable. Yes, he is. Good God. He... He's indescribable. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Yeah. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And ever, how long is that? And ever, and ever, and when you get through with all of the forevers, then amen. Good God Almighty, amen. Amen. We were taught that unless you affix your signature to the letter, it was not yours, it's not binding. Somebody can type out a letter for you, but it doesn't mean a thing to you until you put your signature there. Now, you can pray all that other. You can say it verbatim, or paraphrase it, whatever you want to do. But when, after you've said it all, if you can't say amen, then it doesn't mean a thing. You see, we are just having a rehearsal down here. <laughs> we are practicing down here what we going to do when we get on the other side. Now, you know, I feel sorry for some people who think it's going to be quiet and still there. Oh, no, that's going to be shouting. You're not going to be tipping around there talking about the... Well, thank God I made it over. <laughs> no, you're going to be shouting. Yeah. There's going to be movement. Some of you are going to get run over. <laughs> There's going to be movement. I said, we're having a rehearsal down here. If you can't act right in the rehearsal, you're not going to be in the performance. <laughs> Whoa! When I was at Southwestern Seminary, they taught me how to stand in the same track. They taught me how to hold my Bible. And they taught me how to gesture to emphasize my points. They even taught me how to regulate and modulate my voice so it wouldn't be so loud and obnoxious. <laughs> and I passed the course. Whoa, but when I get to thinking about 
the one who saved me. I can't help but get loud. I can't help but shout. And if you think I'm shouting now, you just wait until my feet strike Zion. You just wait until I behold his face. You just wait until I join with that chorus that come up through trials and tribulations and we join in singing amen. 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 Amen and amen.